I recently went to something called a nap-in. And a nap-in is where a bunch of flint nappers meet up to nap together. And not in the term of sleeping together, but napping is in flint napping. And flint napping is the process of reducing stone down into a usable tool, knife, or projectile. So uh, making stone tools. Something I'd like to address though, as we get into the rest of this video about the nap-in, I want to talk about an event that happened last year. I was selling art last year and like as people came by to look at the art, I was flint napping under my little, you know, tent gazebo thing. And a man came up to me holding hands with, uh, I think two children and uh, he was visibly indigenous. And as he came up to me, he said hello and talked. And then he said to his kids, and this always stuck with me and I've thought about this all year was that's our heritage what stuck with me was like is he saying i stole his heritage was he frustrated that we're practicing his heritage and he's not did he have pride in that statement was he just genuinely telling his children this is our heritage this is something that you need to be aware of that your people used to do the more I thought about it all year, I just like, it kind of just stuck in my mind. And of course, like I talked to him and I asked him what nation he was from or what tribe. And I believe he was Choctaw. We had a nice conversation, said hi, talked to the kids and, and they left. But it begs the question to me, stone tools is a human technology. Like everybody practiced napping at some point. And it just so happens that napping persisted much longer in North America than it did the rest of the world. Uh, but at the end of the day, everybody flint napped and it just, it's a lost craft all around, except for the people who recreate it and practice it. So I kind of asked myself at what level is flint napping appropriation versus just respect for the craft and also just a craft in general. I'm an anthropologist. So these things kind of go through my mind when I talk to people of different, you know, cultures and ethnicities. So I want to dive into flint napping a bit more. The way to describe flint napping. I mean, it's the process of making stone tools and you can't just use any stone. It has to be stone with silica in it. And the way sedimentary rock uh, can turn into chert or the flint, whatever you want to call it, for millions and millions of years of plankton and silicus, like little animals compress down on the seabed and it turns into something that kind of breaks like glass. So it's silicus, it, it's able to fracture in a certain way. And that's how stone tools work. You can also nap things like obsidian or glass because they break in the exact same way. If you've ever seen a broken car window, it's the same thing. Those little fissures that f like come from the impact across, that's exactly how flint napping functions. You're just controlling those cracks to systematically peel off flakes from a stone. So flint napping, I guess, kind of begins, you can say, with possibly Australopithecines making stone tools, but definitely Homo habilis making stone tools. And the first stone tool industry would be Oldowan. And then later on, Homo erectus shifts to what we would call Acheulean or Achulean, and they make very specific Achulean hand axes. And this is a technology that spans all of Africa, Europe, Asia, and almost all the way down into Australia. And it's called an Achulean hand axe. It's a multi-tool. It's been used for 2 million years by all hominids. And honestly, up until stone tools were replaced by metal all around the world, everybody flint napped. Making stone tools is the ultimate survival skill. You can use stone tools to cut things. You can use stone tools to make projectiles. You can use stone tools to make fire, uh, essentially. It, it, it's fundamentally human and every human has done it throughout all of history. So fast forward to today, flint napping is kind of just a hobby people have. It's not necessarily a way of life uh, for most people, uh, <laughs> even the... I mean, some people do it for survival techniques. I do it to replicate archaeology and just to, to understand how ancient people thought, especially making stone tools. You really get into the mind of ancient people. Like, I, I, I can't explain it. You just have to try it. But anyway, but there's a community around that hobby. And a lot of people come together at these things called nap-ins to, to nap together, to make stone tools together, to share ideas, to share stone, to, to sell, and honestly, just to come together to have camaraderie. Okay, so what they're doing is taking, it's a whole napping circle, and they're taking a point and hitting a, you know, a freehorn, taking three or so flakes off of it, and then passing it to the next person, and it goes around in the circle. It's pretty sweet. Well, moving forward. Nappins are coming together. It's people coming together and they meet up and it's kind of like a yearly like, hey, how's it going? You drink, you camp out, like you have fun. What's happening? I am drinking a lot of whiskey out of a Kuska. <laughs> 
And one thing I, I definitely noticed at this nap in and, and the ones I've been to is your trading knowledge. Everyone has their own way of flint napping. Obviously the process works similarly for everybody. You have to reduce the stone by systematically shearing off flakes to get the desired outcome. However, some people have a way different technique. Some people hold it this way. Other people hold it this way. Some people do what's called indirect percussion, which I'll show here. I don't think I've gotten a video of indirect yet, so. I've been in country living. And it's not necessarily taking direct percussion where I would take a stone or an antler and directly hit the stone. It is something that, you know, I can be more accurate and I hit that to drive the same force through it. And I learned that at a nap in and it fundamentally changed how I flint napped and I was better at it because of that. And I wouldn't have learned that without going to a nap in. Some people use what's called abo, which is aboriginal, which is only using stone and antler to flint nap. Other people use copper because uh, copper is very effective and it kind of works the same exact way as antler. It's a soft metal and it, it you're more accurate and more precise and it will stay consistent. Whereas antler, you know, you have to keep sanding it down and reshaping it. Another thing that happens at a nap in is sales. People bring rock from all over the country. Some people bring rock from Texas. Some people bring rock from Wyoming. Some people bring obsidian from California and even obsidian from Mexico I saw there. And it's really cool to see the different rock and you sell it and essentially like based on the, the rarity of the rock or the stone and how well it flint naps is the more expensive it is, you know? And it's just cool seeing uh, an ancient thing like this that still is going on. Another thing I saw a lot of is people selling finished points. And obviously this, this event is open to the public and the public comes in and can buy and, and learn from people too. And people sell really beautifully made points. And again, it's a craft. It's not necessarily a daily way of life anymore, right? It's a craft, it's a hobby, and it's something that you can make artistic. The artistry of some of the points just blows my mind because I will never be that good at flint napping, but some people just make straight up works of art and it's very impressive and they, they sell that there and they make quite a bit of money on it but of course people are also selling jewelry some people make the stone tools and then turn them into necklaces or they're selling gems or you know marble wooden things they made beads some people sell knives but again it's just like simple i wouldn't say aboriginal or primitive but ancient crafts that people practice and sell because it's a hobby and a fascination we all share said this a bunch of times now but I want to reiterate the camaraderie aspect of a nap in is the coolest part to me because you people grill out they cook every time I've gone to one I've been completely provided for people are always like come on come eat which is really nice and people treat me like family and it's really fun everyone grills and of course when you're barbecuing or eating food around a fire it's always special and another thing too is music people play guitar they play music an Israeli friend that showed up at the nap in last year played this traditional instrument and it was really cool. It's just sharing cultures and ancient traditions at these nap ins that's really fun and special to me. So let's talk about my experience as a flint napper. I'm new to napping. I've only done it since 2020. Like I knew the process of it in college 10 years ago, but I didn't really start getting into it to get good at it until uh, COVID during quarantine. I was going crazy and wanted something to do outside. And in school, I only learned the science of flint napping. Like I can tell you about how it fractures, or really your scars, how like the sedimentary rock is formed, how igneous rock is formed. And honestly, how to tell how many people or what season it was at the site based on stone tools and the bones that are there. Like I know that stuff. I know all of that, but I don't know exactly how to flint nap. And most professors that have taught flint napping or taught lithics, I should say, don't necessarily know how to flint nap. Uh, some do, others don't, but you can't sit and learn flint napping for a whole college course. You have to learn, you know, about lithics because you're an archaeologist learning about stone tools and lithics and hunter gatherers. But something that happened last year is I learned a lot about stone tools and, you know, how seeing how it works and understanding the artifacts that I pick up when I'm doing survey or excavations, you understand more how archaeological sites form based on the flakes and how they were used. It's really cool. And when I went to uh, the Laprell Mammoth site last summer, which I'm making a video about here soon, I was sitting in a, I'll just, I'll just play the video. I'll just play the video. Okay, so yesterday we found this biface, and by we I mean Ken, 
uh, found this over here in this block, uh, right here. And what I want to talk about is like the coolest thing about doing archaeology, especially like knowing how to flint nap, like kind of. Uh, you can pick this up and see where this thing broke, right about here as the guy was trying to thin it. Uh, and then he also used this and retouched it a bit. And the reason he probably did that was because uh, the only outcropping of this, there's none here at this site. So he would have had to have walked several days to a week all the way to the Hartville uplift to get this shirt. So he probably snapped it and was like, fuck it, I'll just use it and like started scraping. So it's cool because you can stand here in the unit and pull it out and it's what, 12,000 years old? And like, figure that out. And by figure that out, I mean you can literally stand in this person's mammoth and bison hide structure 13,000 years later, hold that object in your hand, and almost hear his frustration. That's why anthropology is dope, but also why it matters. I wouldn't have come to that realization unless I had gone to that nap in the year before. It's stuff like that that changes your mind when you start applying archaeology and experimenting with archaeology. One thing I've definitely learned through music and flint napping now, too, is you can only be explained how to do something so many ways from one person. But when you talk to another person who's had a whole other life doing this, they can explain it in a much different way and put it into different metaphors. Or they just explain it in a way that clicks for me sometimes, and I like learning from other people in that sense, and that's the beauty of a nap-in. So all that being said, something I definitely noticed as an archaeologist at a nap-in is it's very similar, if not the same thing, as ancient aggregations. Let's talk about that. Now a hunter-gatherer or a paleolithic aggregation is essentially a place where multiple groups uh, either met up seasonally or yearly or maybe even monthly at a specific site to work together on collecting resources, um, but obviously based on ethnographic uh, accounts of people doing this in the modern day in post-contact in North America is people come together to share knowledge, they come together to share resources. Uh, you can trace genetically trading dogs, which is really cool, we can talk about that later, but also you're trading genetics. Bride trading is the old word for this, but I, I would say marriage brokerage. Because, you know, you can only have so many options in a small group to reproduce with before you start inbreeding. So this is something that would have happened surely in the past, and we can inference this based on a lot of sites. A solid possible example of an aggregation site is Altamira in Europe. Altamira is where those really pretty cave paintings are found, and I think they're like upwards of twenty to 30,000 years old, maybe a little more. But there's a huge occupation at the site that spans millennia. And because the cave offered a distinct landmark and based on the ecosystems and the river valleys and things that we can reconstruct that were there at the time, it would have been a great place for these aggregations. And based on the archaeology, you can see the seasonal settlement patterns of the site, which is cool. But again, it's, it's the cave is a, a massive landmark for this possible aggregation. Also, a site in the Levant called Karana 4, I believe is Karanech. I don't know how you would say that. It's a Epipaleolithic site where there is abundant grassland, there's abundant water resources, and there's an extensive occupation that spans over 1200 years at in a specific time period at this site. And the Levant obviously today still is a big crossroads of cultures and at that time would have also been the same for hunter-gatherers coming through. We can say that a lot of sites in this area were probably aggregation sites, but certainly Karanech. <laughs> And the archaeologists writing this paper say that it possibly, the trade networks from this aggregation area possibly extended to the Mediterranean, down to Syria, and possibly deep into Arabia. So a pretty far area. Another definite aggregation site, and one that I've worked at, is the Topper site, or the more broad term, the Allendale Chert Quarry. And this is an extensive Chert Quarry that is in Allendale, South Carolina. From digging there, and I can tell you myself, has an extensive Paleo-Indian layer, but also woodland, or early archaic, mid-archaic, late archaic, woodland, Mississippian. You can see the stratigraphy of those eras evidenced archaeologically by the stone tools that were left behind. Really cool. So whether a group was staying there year-round, or some people just came seasonally, maybe there were some spiritual aspects to when you could go and nap, or it just depended on if you needed the stone, don't know. But it was probably a big meeting place, like a nap-in. Also, Laprell, the site I talked about earlier, was a very complex and like one of the larger Paleo-Indian sites I've worked on. It's a Clovis mammoth kill site, and while the mammoth is cool in itself, 
What's really cool about this site is the extensive occupation surrounding the mammoth of people processing hides and dyeing the hides as evidenced by a ton of ochre that's around the site and also the scrapers and the flakes used to tan hides. Really cool. But another really cool thing about Laprelle there are tons of channel flakes in several fluted points that we found. And if you're not familiar with the channel flake, here's a little clip. Okay, mm -hmm. so today we found over here in this quad, uh, so what's this, northeast quad, a channel flake. Mark's gonna pull that out here. And a channel flake is essentially Double. what the result of a flute is. It's the part of the stone that comes off when a Paleo Indian has fluted a point. And you can see here at the site, we found quite a bit of them. And whoever was doing this, this population of people, whether they're Clovis or not, uh, right, made you. some channel flakes and they're really good at it. Making Clovis points and doing that flute is very risky because you could break the stone in half. Then you take this risky hit on the end or pressure flake it off uh, to make this flute. And we're not entirely sure why that is. Maybe it's to show prowess. Maybe it helps with hafting. Uh, maybe it's just a signature of the Clovis culture that they did that, but who knows? And a colleague and I were kind of discussing Maybe people came to this site because it was a mammoth kill and the ochre and the stone that was there was sourced miles and miles away. People were coming to this site to flint nap or, you know, take part in the butchering of this mammoth and taking pieces from it. Because there were also bison and other animals found at the site too that were processed. So maybe it was just a large gathering place of people to be like, hey, there's a bunch of hides here. Want some? Don't know. Another thing too, at the nap in, people who can make Clovis points are definitely very good nappers. If you can make a Clovis point, I would define you as a good flint napper. I'm still not to that point yet, but you can see people at these nap ins who make the fluted points either with direct percussion, indirect percussion, or even using a specific jig that helps pressure that off. Because either way, you're just trying to make the, the craft of it, the, the artistic piece of it. You don't necessarily have to do it in the aboriginal way. And then here's the just the beautiful result. Like it, it's a work of art to me. And I think Clovis technology and Clovis points were some of the finest points made in like world history. But now let me get into the cultural observations I made there as an anthropologist. And again, these it wasn't an official study. It was just me being there as a participant observer of, you know, the culture of a nap in that I'm not used to. As an anthropologist, I always observe and I learn. I like people, I like watching how people behave. In the end of the day, I just feel we're all zoological beings still, we're not above that. We have behaviors that are patterns, but we can observe them both biologically and culturally. One thing I learned there is a lot of people are kind of, maybe not resentful, but not keen on archaeologists because, again, archaeologists usually aren't flint nappers. They can talk about stone tools. We also believe we have authority on stone tools sometimes too, or talking about them. But a lot of these people come from different backgrounds and they've napped their whole life and they'll read an archaeology book or paper and be like, that's just not right. And in a lot of cases, they're right. Like, it, we might not be right about that. Sometimes I don't tell them I'm an archaeologist unless someone brings it up and I just kind of listen and I hear a lot of this stuff. But also just hearing them and sometimes participating in these conversations. I don't want to make a vast overgeneralization of the people that go here. It's a bunch of dudes usually from, I would say, rural areas. And something that I learned from them too is everybody that is there, I'd say most people that I talk to got into flint napping because they found an arrowhead or a projectile point on their land as a kid. And they were curious about how the indigenous people made that and they looked it up and they went to the library and figured stuff out or they just kind of figured it out on their own. That's amazing to me because it just shows humans are fascinated by stone tools and we find a way to make them even without the knowledge of that to begin with. Just by looking at one, you get curious and you're like, oh, that's how they did it. And then a lot of people didn't realize it was a huge community until the internet or Facebook. And then they realized a lot of other people do this too. And they all come together at these nap-ins. I found that fascinating. Also, I grew up in a very urban area in Long Island, New York City, and then Nashville. And I have that kind of upbringing and I have, you know, my political and cultural ideas and views. A lot of those were not shared with people at the snap in and that's fine. Like, right, it's people that have different views politically, ideologically, religiously. And it was very fun and also challenging for me to sit and listen to a lot of the conversations. Like at one point, a conversation shifted towards uh, the existence of giants and maybe that archaeologists hide these giants in order to disprove the Bible, things like that. I didn't get involved in the conversation. I don't know if that's the case. I can tell you for a fact, I don't know of any instance of that happening, but where they come up with that idea, I don't know. And especially politically. 
I don't bring up politics usually with people, and it's just a very different political ideology from what I have, but that's good because it challenges my views and my preconceived notions of things, and I think that's really important, especially today. One thing I, I really, really want to stress is the level of respect people have for each other. Some good work, man. Thank you, Bob. These eccentrics are nuts. When they found out I was an archaeologist, they would ask me questions, they recognized my intelligence and my curiosity for learning flint napping, and I would learn from them how to flint nap better, and they would ask me questions about archaeology. And we came together on that, and it was a mutual respect for the craft, and I thought that was awesome. And everybody says, oh, he's the best, or he's the best, or he's the best. Uh, another observation was there's no she's the best. It was cool to see the level of respect of this craft. But I want to dive a little deeper into that respect for the craft and back to the, the scenario I brought up in the beginning of the video. All the nappers there have the utmost respect for the craft, how making stone tools works, how the indigenous peoples uh, in America, but also ancient peoples in Europe and Asia and the Levant and Africa made their stone tools. And it's a deep appreciation for it. And they all have done a lot of research on how it's done. And if you've ever flint napped, you know how hard it is. Like it's a steep learning curve. It's very difficult. It's honestly kind of like 3D chess in your head. And another person described it as a 3D puzzle in reverse because you're taking the big rock and reducing it down and taking puzzle pieces off of it to get to the point that you want at the end. And when you do that, you get a deep appreciation for how intelligent people were in the past. And not just saying 3,000 years ago, I'm saying 2 million years ago or a million years ago with Homo erectus. In my opinion, you have to speak to be able to make stone tools and you have to be able to teach to do stone tools. So Homo erectus had some form of language in my mind based on knowing how bifacial napping works. Something I noticed is there, at least at the nappings I've been to, there were not a lot of indigenous people. In fact, I knew some people said they have, you know, Cherokee ancestry or they're Tuscarora or they're Choctaw in the past, like, or at least have that in their ancestry. But I didn't see anyone who was outwardly like, I'm an indigenous napper or showed off points and tools from their culture. And another thing that it brings me back to that conversation with the indigenous man in the beginning of the video, it just must be odd to sit and like watch a bunch of dudes sit and perform a craft as a hobby that used to be their way of life on the spot we're sitting. I'm not trying to get into the politics of that. I just want to say anthropologically, it was an observation that I thought about. And I thought about that a lot this year to nap in. Another thing too that I was thinking about is, especially I would say North American flint nappers from Paleo Indians up to today were the best flint nappers in the world. The tools they made, the artistry of it, it's just, they're phenomenal. With that being said, a lot of the tools and stone tools and the points that are made, the style is of indigenous American origin. And another reason I wanted to talk about this is whenever I post videos of, of me flint napping on my social media, I inevitably get a comment saying that it is appropriation. And I've seen other people get the appropriation comments. And again, I know where those people are coming from. Like I get it, I, I see what it is. And I do often wonder the people that are commenting that, I wonder if they stop and think, Stone tools are made all around the world. It's not just a Native American thing, you know? It's, it's just something we all practiced at one point in history. So is it appropriation? I don't know. But after talking with a friend and, and several colleagues about this and like kind of grappling with it from last year to today in regards to the conversation I had with that indigenous person, I really thought about this year, what did he mean? What was he thinking when he said that's our heritage? Was it remorse? Was it sadness? I was wondering too if me thinking about this means I'm defensive about that, like I was offended by the comment, which I don't think so, but I also wondered this year, like, what could I do better? But a big concern and a big thing in modern North American archaeology is this idea of decolonization. We live in a post-colonial world where the French, the English, the Spanish, and the Portuguese have completely colonized America. So I wonder, maybe I should reach out to indigenous nappers. Like, obviously they're invited to the nappins, but it seems like it should be something practiced like equally. But I also mean this anthropologically. What are some like spiritual stories behind flint napping? Like what are the mythologies behind flint napping? Surely there are some superstitions or some cultural practices around flint napping, making a certain tool, 
like did you have to bless things before the hunt which i've heard about in cherokee uh mythology and you know it's just stuff like that that i didn't learn at nappins i just learned the physical flint napping aspect i didn't get to learn stories and traditions behind them from the indigenous people that made some of these tools and again we will never know what the stories and traditions were behind them made in europe asia and africa because that's just all gone it was replaced by metal so i don't know i just it'd be interesting to know more about that so I'd like to know what you think. Nappins are unique in that they're a tradition spanning a very long time, millennia, right? And with those ancient aggregation sites, we can definitely presume, if not like factually say, there were aggregations in the past. And it it is cool to me that Nappins are a modern extension of that. I, I find that cool, or a modern recreation and continuation of that practice. And because of that deeply historic and, and global practice of flint napping, it's safe to say that flint napping does belong to everybody. Like everybody can flint nap. It's not something just indigenous people can do. We wouldn't exist today without flint napping being a thing. However, after speaking with some friends and colleagues and doing the nappings the past few years, I do want to explore more of the issues of appropriation and maybe even the profiting off of traditionally Native American artistry or craftsmanship, you know? But again, flint napping belongs to everybody, so what's the divide? I would love to know in the comments if you're indigenous or of indigenous heritage or an anthropologist or flint napper who wants to weigh in on this, I would love to know what you think. And after speaking with that friend, she pointed out to me like, the man who told his kids like, that's our heritage, what I need to stop and think about as a white person living in North America on traditionally Native American land is that he has to process and he has to live with all of that trauma of his culture being erased. I, I can't help that I was born here. I can't help that I enjoy flint napping. But behind those words is a lot of complicated history and cultural diffusion and extermination that like, we really need to, you know, I, I'm not, not one person can fix it, but it's something that I think we should think about. And thinking back on it in that moment, I didn't stop to think about all the trauma and the history of colonization behind that comment. And I, I just want you guys to think next time you flint nap or the next time you go to a nap in or the next time you talk about this, just to think about that. Just anthropologically, I think about it. If you don't want to, that's fine. It's just something I, I never experienced before. And I enjoyed having this conversation with a friend who had views on this topic as a, a non-white American. But I, I do hope maybe this video, if you're a napper, gave you pause and like maybe next time you flint nap you could be like maybe i should reach out to indigenous people and ask about flint napping maybe at the nappings we should make it a point to invite indigenous people and and learn about their histories and traditions behind this ask yourself should i profit off of this tradition is it world tradition or is it just indigenous tradition and maybe all of this talk gives you a greater respect for flint napping and like the complex history behind it especially as white people who don't experience it every day like i think we often overlook that trauma in the history of colonization in the Americas. And I just think it's interesting that flint napping being like a fundamental first human technology, I had this, not epiphany, but I came to this question in my head and felt that I needed to talk about it with other colleagues that are not of my ethnicity. But I'm still gonna nap. I think flint napping is great. Maybe I'm not gonna sell Clovis points. Maybe I will, I don't know. I, I wanna unpack that a little more and talk to people about it. Also, I can't make Clovis points yet, so that's moot. <laughs> but again, it's just gonna make me more mindful when I flint nap and have a deeper appreciation for it. And I hope it does for you too.